All right, what's going on, everybody? Hope everything's working well. I actually just started up a new live streaming platform that's going to be really nice. I'm actually really excited about it. It's I'm, I'm just using one called StreamYard. There's a bunch of other ones out there. But normally, I just use just like the native YouTube one, and you don't have as many you know, options with that. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about this one is that I can bring on a guest and I didn't even know that was an option with YouTube. I knew you could do it with Instagram, but, um, you can really easily send a link out to a guest. Anyone who has a webcam can hop on and, um, it should be pretty easy and simple. So I'm excited about that feature and I really want to bring some cool people on. So let me know in the comments who you think we could do some fun guest, um, you know, guests on this thing and just have a good time. Uh, it'd be fun to bring some people on that we could really learn from and get some value out of. Um, man, I'm thinking, you know, Tanner Claridge, Odin Clack, Savvy, um, Shane Smith, just, uh, you know, I'm kind of naming off a lot of my friends in the beginning. I'd love to, you know, meet some new people and learn from some, from some heavy hitters. Um, what's going on, everybody? Mike John Leather, Leo Wild, Andrew Miller, Birdie Bear. What's going on, guys? Thank you for jumping in. So because of the new uh, live streaming software that I'm using, we're also able to stream multi-platform. So this is the first time streaming on Facebook. I usually just do YouTube or Instagram. But because of this, we can do both, and that's amazing. So if you're here from Facebook, thank you for jumping in. Um, yeah, let's get this thing going. Jim Jenkins in the house. What's up? Uh, the Duke. What's up, Killinger? All right. Um, so let me pull up my notes here real quick. Okay, so the first thing I want to bring up, you can actually see it in the ticker down there. That's another new feature. So fancy now. Um, we're giving this bag away. And uh, it's, it's a really simple giveaway. I actually started building out this really intense, like, um, extensive kind of program to give this thing away through some different software on our website. And it was going to like collect points depending on how, you know, like each dollar would contribute to uh, an entry and it was going to like keep track of it all. And then it would have like bonuses for social sharing and all that kind of stuff. And it got so complicated and so intense. And then I started running into like some legal issues. Um, you know, technically you're, uh, well, there, there's a lot of things. Utah especially has some hard um, raffle laws. And so I was really skirting the line with that. And I was like, you know what? We're just going to keep this low key. Uh, make a donation to Veterans Stand United um, instead of doing it directly to them. And, and you can do that if you want. But in order to make it easy for the giveaway, contribute at least $5 or more to our Venmo account. And then I'm just going to submit all the money that goes into the Venmo account to Veterans Stand United collectively. And I'm just going to scroll through the Venmo list to pick a winner. This is all happening on Wednesday, the 16th, I believe. Yeah. So next week. Um, so, you know, you got a little bit of time, but go submit a donation. You can do just the bare minimum if you want $5 or you can do more. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. It's, it's hard for me to kind of get, step into a place of empathy for our veterans because I'll never be able to relate to what they experience or what they're experiencing now. But, um, you know, I've, I've talked to quite a few of them recently, in, including, uh, one, I, I'll, I won't say his name, but, um, one guy recently that is really struggling and, it just like really hit home for me. I, I, I can't even empathize. I can't imagine what it's like to go through that. Um, and, and I just want to do whatever I can to help out. And the problem is I don't know how, <laughs> so I'm always open. I'm all ears. If there's anything I can do to help out the veteran community. Um, but uh, Veterans stand United is an organization that was started by my friend, Dustin Haggett. And uh, it's an amazing cause. It's, it, it, they're, they're giving veterans, um, you know, a chance to uh, kind of step back into the field a little bit and have some purpose and, and uh, go on missions and do some really cool stuff that, um, you know, I think the opportunities wouldn't have been there otherwise. And, and they're doing some really cool, positive things. So go jump in there and make a donation. 
Uh, this is the bag. Turned out beautiful. You know, we could have just put it up for sale. I consider just putting it up for, this, for sale on our website, you know, 2,000, 2,500 bucks um, and just waiting till it sold and then contributing the money. But I feel like this gave everyone an option or an opportunity to own this bag where, you know, there's very few people who can afford a bag like that. And this allows everyone to have a shot. So um, Jim asked if he can donate here. Um, Unfortunately, we're only running it through Venmo, and I know that's frustrating because not everyone has Venmo. Look at that. They're coming in right now as we speak. Thank you, guys. Um, I know not everyone has Venmo. It's a U.S.-only app, but um, in order to you know, put yourself in my shoes, as far as running the actual giveaway, I'm just going to be scrolling through the entries and picking them randomly. If there's entries that are outside of Venmo, um, it, it's, it's not going to contribute to this nice like random list that I can pick from. So um, you know, I'm, I'm, I apologize if anyone feels left out. In fact, I had someone from Canada recently reach out and they're like, Hey man, I've been a supporter of yours forever. Why would you leave us out? I'm like, look, there's a lot of factors that come into that. One is shipping. This is one of the reasons why we can't include international one shipping. Um, I was reading that there's actually some legality about how, if you run a raffle, it can't be outside of the U S I'm not sure about that one because we're doing it. Uh, um, the, it's going to a 501c3 organization and that kind of eliminates a lot of the raffle laws from what I understand. But um, the point is, um, you know, this, uh, we have to keep this simple and doable in a way that you can just, you know, I, I, we have to be able to ship it without spending another, you know, 50 bucks on our part to send it out. So um, Canada, we're still going to include you. If you're from Canada and you want to be part of this, feel free to go contribute and you can be part of the giveaway just because I've shipped bags to Canada before and it's not a whole lot more than um, the U S but uh, again, trying to just keep this really simple and I don't want to exclude anyone. And I apologize if it feels that way, but uh, that's just how these giveaways go sometime. Um, I just secured my first big retail purchase. Your videos inspired us here at Big Head Leather. Right on. Thank you so much. What was the retail purchase? I'm curious. David Goodwin says, keep up the awesome work. Thank you so much. The Duke says, I'd love it if you made it in veg tan. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know me. I always love natural veg tan. But to be technical, this is Shell Cordovan, which is technically vegetable tanned. Um, but this stuff is worth way more than your standard like vegetable tooling, which is why we're doing a giveaway and making a big fuss about it. So we'll, we'll make a, a natural veg tan number 60 if you want one. Um, just send me an email. I work at a Virginia. By the way, Michael's here. You've probably seen him in the back already, but what's up, Michael? He's the one that would be making your bag if you did want to order one. Uh, we have a bunch of number 88s that I haven't gotten on the site yet that he's been cranking out. And I'm excited to put make those available. But um, yeah, even though our website doesn't show a number 60 Western like this, if you want one, just let us know and I'll get the order on the leather on hand on order. And uh, Michael will whip one up for you. He's, he's getting wicked at these bags. I was talking about your shoulder bag, Parker. Shoulder bag. Uh, which one are you talking about? The number 88, maybe? Because this is technically a shoulder bag, too. This has a shoulder strap. It just is over on the workbench. Yeah. Sure. yeah. This is a... Michael just finished this one. It's in like a chestnut. It's the leather that we were doing our holsters out of. It's like a chestnutty kind of color. It's pretty cool. This might be what you were talking about, Killinger. Um, thanks, Mike. But yeah, that's a beautiful bag. We'll get that one up on the site soon too. We're just He's just cranking out so many of these things and they're looking good. I got to remember to look at the camera. It's hard because I've got comments down here, seeing myself here and up here, but I got to look here. So we'll get this. Uh, would you recommend Smith's Leather Bomb as a finish? Yeah, it just depends on what the context is, what the leather is, uh, what you're trying to accomplish with it. Um, Smith's Leather Bomb is something that is it works as sort of a good conditioner and a little bit of a sealant or like a waterproofer. It doesn't make it waterproof, but um, it'll definitely 
you know, weatherproof your bag a little bit more than just like raw natural veg 10 would, would have. So it's, it's good stuff. It basically just makes your leather healthy. Think of it like that. It's like putting lotion on your skin. Um, it's, it's, uh, if you've got really dried up boots that you maybe got wet one time, you know, throw some Smiths on it and it'll wake them right up. Uh, let's see. Can you do a crossbody in veg tan? Oh, the crossbody, dude. I'm glad you asked that because yeah, we don't have dyes for that, but, um, wit's pretty adamant about this. We've been really wanting to start making some of those in-house, um, in small batches. We've been getting them through Waterbury and they've been great. Um, but you know, we just, we're so bottlenecked over there. We've got a lot of other stuff we want to make with them. And so we're going to try doing some smaller batches here in house. I just need to make up the pattern first. Um, so yeah, we'll do that. Thanks for asking Killinger. Birdie bears is great color. Awesome back. Thanks for the inspiration. Nice. What's your brand name? I need one. I'm a medically separated veteran. Thank you for your support. Thank you so much, John. I just, I appreciate you guys being here. I know that Leathercraft kind of creates a good, you know, therapeutic place to be for veterans. And um, I wish that I could relate more. I wish I could empathize, but I love that that's such a big part of our community. So thank you again. Uh, matter of fact, I really need one. All right, man. Well, um, send me an email because maybe, you know, with, with that, motivation maybe i'll make an effort to make the pattern up and we'll start cranking up little batches wit will be happy that if we finally do those again amy says those bags hard eyes thank you um yeah just send me an email killinger all right we got to get to some of the stuff here so it, does that make sense with the giveaway it's really simple all you do is make a donation of five dollars or more to our venmo account the link to our Venmo account is in the description of this video, or you can find it on our Instagram. Um, it's just at stock and barrel. It's the same handle that's on our Instagram and everywhere else. So find us on Venmo. You'll see our logo as the profile picture and uh, make a small donation. And I'm just going to be choosing randomly from the list of the people who contribute in Venmo. And that'll be on Wednesday, the 16th. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. All the proceeds are going to Veterans Stand United, which is an organization I really love and care about. And uh, I think I think this will be fun. It's kind of a cool mix-up of a uh, way to do things. Do you buy grade A Herman Oak? I recently bought a side of grade B and was really disappointed with the quality. It still died and tooled well, but that cow had a rough time. Yeah, man, there's, there's a lot to that. I honestly I haven't bought very much Herman Oak, so I can't speak too much on that. But we've bought a few hides. We have one notorious hide that's been living in our shop. It's the Herman Oak hide from hell. And the reason we can't get through it is because it's impossible to cut. And I can't bring myself to throw it away, but um, it is it, grade wise. I don't know what grade it was, probably grade A because it, it, it had really good yield, but it's so hard to cut. I, I think it was just an anomaly. Something weird is going on with it. And um, that was like one of my few experiences with Herman Oak. And then I've also bought some from Springfield, which is probably hit or miss. I'm sure they send out some good stuff, but the kind that I got was pretty rough. And I've heard the same from uh, my buddy Ian and Michael. You said that too, didn't you? Have you ordered from Springfield? Not maybe Springfield, not. No. Okay, yeah, but you can get it from Weaver Springfield. I don't know, man. Yeah, maybe maybe grade. What'd you say you got B? Maybe B is just not the way to go. Might be worth stepping it up to grade A. Um. Do you have to be 18 to enter? Yes, you do. Or if it's like a really, you know, big deal, maybe just like, I don't know. Yeah, have your parents do it or something. My concern with that is that I don't want kids, you know, donating their parents' money to this without them knowing. That could be an issue. And since that's the only way to enter, we got to do 18 or older. So thank you for asking. Uh, have you tried Waterproof 1881 or whatever it is? No, I haven't. Constantinos T. Hi, Parker. Hey, what's going on? All right, let me get to the next topic. Oh, yeah, I just want to get into the Q&A section. So let me pull up some of the questions we got on Instagram. We didn't get many. You guys kind of surprised me. I thought we were going to get a lot more. I mean, I only posted it this morning, like a couple hours ago. So it makes sense. But I don't have a lot of questions yet. Okay, one of them was, is it one entry per donation or one entry per dollar? 
Um, yeah, for the giveaway. So I kind of covered that. But when I initially was setting up the, you know, really extensive, well thought out, well premeditated program for this, it was one entry per dollar. But because of the nature of this, I can't really, um, I, there's no way for me to really like count that and, and make it work. I'm literally just looking at my Venmo account and I'm going to pull a few random ones, put it into a random generator and have it draw one. So I will tell you, I don't know if this is, I'm hesitant to say this because I don't know if this feels fair to other people, but I'm going to go through and pull like the first one in the list, the last one in the list. And then I'm going to pull like a few that are the higher donations. Cause we've had a few people that dropped some really good money, which is so generous. And I really appreciate that. Um, and I want to make sure that, you know, what that tells me is that they either really want this bag or they really care about the cause. And for that reason, I'm going to probably go through and pick out some of the higher donations as well to put in the list. And then we'll do a random generation. So, um, and it's not just those. I'm not just pulling from the high ones. I'm going to go through and pull a bunch of random ones. I'm just going to scroll through. The list is really long even now. So, yeah, I, I'm not saying that that officially will help the, uh, you know, your entry. It's not like exactly one entry per dollar. But the higher entries, I'm going to give a little bit of favor to just because I appreciate it so much. All right, next question. Which sewing machine and thread type are you using? Thanks in advance. So that's a good question. There's a lot of things going on. We got, I've got three machines in here. We got a Cobra class three, which is for the heavy duty stuff. I run 207 bonded nylon thread in that. And I use that for like the heavier, um, the things that require a little bit heavier stitching. Like you can see on this gusset right here. Let me turn on the, I don't know if that's gonna work. Anyway, the stitching right here is a lot heavier than like the stitching on this detail trim. Oh yeah, I can see that now. Anyway, <laughs> just experimenting a little, but um, yeah, so there's different use cases for every machine and different thread type. So if I'm doing a holster, a knife sheath, um, a heavy duty bag, you know, I'm using like eight to nine ounces and sewing gussets together. I always like to use 207 for that on my class three harness stitcher. Um, for wallets, we mostly just use the Juki 1508 um, with 92 thread. It's like a size 18 or 19 needle, usually 18. And I do like the Juki, but I, I, I need to swap it out because Every time, just the simple fact that I'm using it is usually a signal to people that go, oh, that must be the one that I should buy. And I I probably wouldn't suggest that because that machine has um, always had a hard time with the speed reducer on it. They don't come with one on and they're really not meant to have one. The only place that you're able to put a speed reducer on is right in the way of the oil pan. And I had to just bash the tar out of my oil pan to get it to fit. And even then the belts just don't line up that great. And so it squeaks a lot. It's just not, I don't know. It, if you wanted to get used to a higher speed stitch, just use the servo motor, slow it down as much as you can. And I think you could get away with it being a pretty decent leather machine, but you're not going to have as much torque and you're not going to be able to slow it down as much without the reducer. So if I was going to recommend one to kind of replace that 1508 right there it would probably be like a cobra class 20 just because it ha it comes with the speed reducer it's you know it slows way down um i haven't owned one though that has to come with that disclaimer i just know that i've always loved my other cobra machines like our burnisher and the class three so brady linebaugh on my way yeah man we've got a fun little mission today as soon as i get done with this live stream i'm going to do something really fun i don't think i can say what it is though because it could get me in trouble and i hate it when people do that but i had to just mention it because brady says he's on his way up so we'll see you in a bit dirty b uh birdie bear says i'm learning i learned sewing on a juki nice i'm just starting and i really oh i'm just starting like really just starting cool that's awesome man everyone starts somewhere um why wouldn't you just random all the entries? You basically just said a donation doesn't mean you have even entered. 
No, it does. It's all random. It, the whole, it, it is random because I'm going to be scrolling through and just grabbing them randomly. Um, the reason I'm not putting every single one into a random generator is because um, it would take me a week to manually input every single one into a random generator. Um, I know that it doesn't seem like the most efficient way, but I'm telling you, I tried setting it up using a viral sweep software app on our website and it started getting really complicated and really intense. And uh, the more I started diving into it, the more I was like, this is going to take me a week to set up. This is getting way too complicated. And so I decided to backtrack everything. I have way too much to do. I was like, I'm just going to just submit your donation on Venmo. And it is random. There's, it's no me doing this and scrolling through and picking one is no different than the random generator. It's still random. So I'm going to be scrolling through and just picking ones, putting it into the random generator. And um, yeah, it. either way, it's all going to an awesome cause. So I appreciate all of you guys. It's, it's so cool. And I, I, I you know, I, 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 it's fun that we get to be a part of something like this. What's your favorite holster leather? Um, you just you can't go wrong with straight up natural tooling, whether it's Wicket, Herman Oak, um, you know something from Tandy. It, if you if you're working with natural tooling without any dye or wax or oil, it's going to mold better. It's going to you know shape better. All of it. It'll just be you'll be better off. So why is my hat looking crooked? <laughs> can't have that. Um, what do you think of the Tandy Cellrite machine? Um, I actually have a video. I posted two videos about that. The first one was kind of more of an unboxing video um, of me experiencing it in the moment for the first time. And I, I was really excited about it. And sometimes people took that the wrong way. So take that one, you know, with a grain of salt. But then I did a second one, which is more of an in-depth review, which is like my feelings of it now that we've owned it for over a year. So, um, go watch that one, the second video of the Tandy Stitchmaster. Um, my first prototype came out super cool. Awesome. Good for you. That's really cool. Let me pull up some of these other questions, and then we'll just jump into the questions in the comment thread here. How did you – this is from Stumptown Leather. How did you start learning how to sew? So my the, 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 uh, the reason I decided to jump into sewing – it was around 2016. It was because we had just launched a Kickstarter campaign and our wallets. So, so I kind of built the campaign based around our wallets being hand stitched. And because they were hand stitched, it took me more time to make them. So it was, uh, the price was a lot higher. Like our number 52 vertical wallet was priced at $120. And, um, I put a lot of time and effort into this campaign. And as soon as we launched it, it was crickets. It was just, there were no, no, uh, I mean, there was a few coming in, but we had very little. And I was really expecting a lot of traffic because we had been building an email list and really hyping it up. And I thought for sure we'd be, you know, in the six figures with this campaign. And um, yeah, it was crickets. So I sent out a survey about halfway through the campaign and said, um, what's the problem? We had a lot of feedback that it was price. And so I said, well, would you rather have a wallet that's $120 that's hand stitched, or would you rather have one that's $50 and it's stitched on a machine? And it was unanimous. Everyone was like, we don't care about it being hand stitched, go with the machine. And so I was like, sweet, I'll do it. I mean, that was a survey of like 1500 people. And it was it literally, it was almost unanimous. So I was like, what have I been doing <laughs> my whole career? Uh, here I am thinking that everyone only cared about hand stitching and they just didn't. So I decided to uh, buy a machine right then and there. And I, I went through a lot of different machines. You know, the, the campaign had like 15 more days at that point. And I was like, all right, I've got some time to figure this out. And I bought uh, like a tailoring machine that was not right for, you know, I had no idea. I had no sewing machine education. I bought one that wasn't even a walking foot and it was a clutch motor. Uh, didn't even have enough room under the presser foot. I turned it on for the first time and it was like, Brrr! and the whole thing was like bouncing. It was a monster. And I was like, I knew immediately that I had the wrong machine. And so I sold it on the classifieds and bought 
<laughs> a few more bad ones. And as I was going through these, I was realizing, oh, there's things I need. Okay, I need a walking foot. And oh, I need a little more room under the presser foot. And I was like, how do I slow it down? Oh, I need a servo motor with a variable speed. So I eventually landed on a Juki 1508. No, no, that's not true. No, I ended up, I got, I got a, getting a phone call. I got a Cobra class, or sorry, a Cowboy 3200. That was kind of the first like good machine I got that was like, oh, now we're in the right place. And I sewed up most of the wallets from that campaign. We got like 700 wallets. Most of them were sewed up on that Cobra, or gosh dang, Cowboy 3200. And um, yeah, and it worked great, but about halfway through that 700 wallets, I was like, man, this thing's, you know, it's punching some big holes. And I was using 207 thread because I wanted it to look like it was this, you know, similar to our hand stitched stuff. I didn't want to change the images too much. And I was like, I, I was really bent on making sure it looked the same as our hand stitch. And the more I started, you know, going down that that journey of 700 wallets, I was like, I need a smaller stitch because, um, you know, the, the big um, needle just destroys little details of a wallet. So I went down a little bit to 138 and then I even went down more to 92 and I was like, this is the sweet spot. I could get a really good looking, clean, professional looking stitch and it wasn't smashing the edges and, you know, falling off the edge and the back stitch didn't look terrible, you know, for, for a little small product, with detail work, you need smaller thread. It you just it just didn't work having 207. So I ended up switching and I got the Juki 1508. And uh yeah, I wanted it to feel like the cowboy. So that's when I got the speed reducer and the servo and and I've been using that machine ever since. So uh okay, let me pull up another question. Oh, but I I don't know if I answered that one right. It said, how did you start learning? It was kind of just uh, trial and error. There's a few videos on YouTube at the time, but that's a big part of why I wanted to ramp up our YouTube channel. And I've even more recently been thinking I want to put out a lot more like sewing machine specific videos because um, as soon as I decided to start learning how to sew, I realized there just wasn't much out there. So um, nothing wrong with the cowboy. Yeah, that's right. I loved that cowboy machine. Um, it was just just not for wallets, you know, it was great for heavy duty stuff for the bags I was making. Um, hey, Lee Prim's here. What's up, Lee? Glad to have you here. Um, what are the, let's see. I already read that one. I think I had some questions come in on YouTube. So let me hurry and pull those up. Oh, maybe I, just realized I don't know how to get to that from my phone. Okay, here we go. Home. What? Should be able to go. Oh, that's why I'm in the wrong account. Sorry, guys. Dead air. Let's switch over to the right channel. Your channel. Community. There we go. All right. Now, I posted that one right before I went live, so I figured there wouldn't be many. There's only one question in there. What was your biggest investment in Leathercraft? Um, honestly, I, I know this is kind of cheesy to say, but I probably just have to say time because, um, you know, there's no way I can add up like the amount of late nights and uh, just long, long hours, weekends, you know, just like trial and error, just testing things and playing. And uh, that's probably the biggest investment I could have made. As far as like financial investment, it's probably, it's been in product for sure. Uh, like an in inventory, we've, you know, we spend sometimes 10, over $10,000 just to get a, a run of our bags made up or something like that. So that's a huge investment. But for just talking tools, you know, probably one of my machines, like, Cobra or something like that. Yeah. So let me get to some of the questions in the comments. All right. Oh, I like this question. What are your, th let me show it up here. Hey Parker, what are your thoughts on keeping inventory in stock versus the made to order approach for a small time leather business? At what point did you start 
stocking inventory? Um, that's a good question. And it really has a lot to do with, um, well, I'll keep it up there. It really has a lot to do with the product you're making because there's a lot of products that probably are better as a made to order. Like I'm just thinking of like our quick, our fast drop, you know, holster, gun belt combos. You know, when somebody orders, there's a lot of variants that go into play. You got to tell me what caliber you want the ammo loops to be, what size the belt is. If Are you a right or left-handed shooter? So there's a lot of factors. And in that case, I'd be like, yeah, stick to made to order. You get an order come in, it's a little bit custom. Um, and of course, all like the fully custom stuff should be made to order. But if you plan on just putting up like a few key, you know, standard offering products, like let's say you got a bag and two wallets and some kind of cool keychain, and you just want to keep selling those over and over, I would definitely recommend making a small batch of each first. Um, it doesn't have to be huge. It can just be like five of each or something because as soon as you can move into the shipping within 24 to 48 hours model, you're going to make your customers so much happier. Um, and, and you're going to be happier too because you'll actually be excited to see an order come in. So I used to like with our bags, especially, you know, it'd be the weekend and I'd see an order come in. I'm like, oh, we got a bag order. And I'd be like, oh, but that means, oh, you know, I better go in to the shop tomorrow to get it made. And it would like ruin my weekend in a way. Cause I knew I had to put some hours in to get it done. Um, but if you're making them ahead of time and you don't have the, the, the deadline of someone sitting on the other end, just twiddling their thumbs, waiting for it to be done. You can't control factors that come into play. Like you don't know if, you know, maybe a family trip comes into play and all of a sudden that customer's order gets pushed back for the whole week that you're gone. So I would way rather prepare ahead of time. Just get like five of each thing ready and uh, do kind of like a drop batch model, which is proven. I mean, I don't know how far down to go into this, but like, I don't know if you've noticed the marketing world is changing 100%. You look at like big YouTubers and influencers, they're doing nothing but drop model um, businesses where they produce a product. One of them, this is a good example. I've got it over here. You can't really see it, but this is the Peter McKinnon camera bag. Um, you know, their model is like, we're only making a certain limited number of these and we're going to launch it all at one time. And then you sell them all at once. And um, you can kind of take that same approach, but on a more limited scale where you say, you know, you put up a post, check out these five bags I just made. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. Um, I put a lot of time into them. You can tell a story around them. And then you can say, I'm going to make them available on Monday morning. Whoever wants them, go get them. You're, and when, when you're doing that, you're creating more hype. You're creating a little bit more of the scarcity approach because people see that picture and they go, oh man, there's only five. That means I got to be one of those five or else I'm going to miss out. Where if you just have a picture on your website of a product and there's seemingly an unlimited number of that because they think, okay, there's that. I can order as many, you know, I'm not going to order it now because I could come back at any time and he'll probably still have it on his website. You don't have that like urgency or scarcity of the batch method. So I would move into that pretty soon if, if it works for your business model and your workflow. I think it's smart beyond just like being prepared for orders coming in. It's actually a good marketing approach as well. Um, I'm thinking about getting the Juki 1450. I don't know anything about the 1450, honestly. It's the lower class, the 1508. Um, if it's lower, then I'd probably say no. The, the only one I know is the 1541. That's probably what you're talking about, right? Yeah, the 1541 is good. I've heard um, like Ted at Buckle, uh, he doesn't work for Buckle Guy. He works for, uh, his brother is Hugh who owns Buckle Guy. What's Ted? Ah. Uh, I can't remember the, his business name, but anyway, he had a 1541 and kind of sold me on it at one point. But then when I went into Dane Sewing to buy the 1541, they recommended I go up to the 1508 because it's definitely made for leather. Um, if you found a good deal on one, then maybe go for it. But if you have the option of getting one or the other, I'd go with a 1508 for sure. It's definitely more targeted for, for uh, leather. All right. Did you, 
All right, Billy Lucero says, did you start out with pre-order shopping cart? I'm thinking that's kind of the same. I think that's kind of the same question as before, I'm guessing, where it's like, are you making things before you ship them out? Or if you're just saying the pre-order model, um, that's kind of what we did with Kickstarter, which is always a good idea because you're eliminating the risk. Kickstarter or any other like pre-order platform has built in market research. You get to find out if customers or people even like your product before you go invest a bunch of time and money into it. So yeah, I definitely recommend a uh, pre-order model. Um, thanks Billy. And that's, he's coming over from Facebook. So it's cool that uh, this is working out. I've just, I've never gone live on Facebook. So this is really fun. Okay. Kirk Schwartz says, "Is <laughs> I'm so glad you asked this. Oh my gosh. Is the free pattern link a cup from a couple days ago on Facebook legit or a scam? It is 100% a scam. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's real. Um, but Michael can attest to this because he, we, we just suddenly started getting a bunch of emails in our account saying, Hey, this sucks. I signed up for the thing and I didn't get the thing. This is a scam. What, what's going on? All it was, was, um, a little box was forgot, forgot to be checked while Thomas was setting up the campaign. We had a Facebook ad campaign and he was, um, it just had to, to be like connected to our email flow so that when you sign up with your email, it gets connected to the, our email list and flow over on Clavio, which sends you an email with the pattern. Well, that connection was broken. It was just a mistake, but we had like probably a hundred people sign up with it that way. And I feel terrible. You know, I hate, I don't like being in that place where people think I'm scamming anybody because I would never do that. That's not my, not my MO. I would never run my business like that. And, and honestly, it's, I'm kind of hesitant to run ads and like selling the course kind of puts me into that place of like, Oh, just one of those like sleazy online entrepreneurs. It's not that at all. It's all very genuine and honest. Um, it's just, it, we just made a mistake is all it was. So if you or anyone on here signed up for that and didn't get the pattern, just send me an email or let me know here and I'll, I'll send you an email with the pattern straight up. I'll just send it over to you physically. Um, it's just an honest mistake. So thank you for asking that. Let me clear that up. Um, and it's working by the way now. So if you get an ad saying, Hey, here's a free pattern, sign up for it. Cause it'll work. You'll get it. Um, all right. Quiet down, Mike. Who's saying, what did I miss? I feel like I missed something juicy. <laughs> I can't find it. Um, okay. Oh, good question, Brandon. Is it possible to sew a bag like the one that you're giving away from start to finish with the Juki 1508? If not, are you making one or two? I'm making one or two. I'm not sure about that last part. Um, but but to answer the first part of your question, um, what you're asking is, can you sew this bag on a Juki 1508? The answer is yes for almost all of it. All these detail pieces are better on a Juki. In fact, I think we... Yeah, we did these on the Juki, the straps, the lash tabs, the trim. Um, definitely, that can all be done on a Juki. The only thing that you can't do is gussets. And that was my nemesis because um, there was a point where I sold my Cowboy and only had my Juki 1508. And I was completely limited in the bag. Work. I couldn't make bags. I, I like stopped making bags during that time because it's impossible to get around a corner like this without having the angle of the cylinder arm to be able to drop the bag down and work your way around a corner. It's just not, I mean, I don't want to say it's impossible. I'm sure someone could figure it out, but it's really hard. And I would recommend if you're, if you plan on doing bags as well as like small leather goods, I would recommend a Cobra class 26 or something in that class. It's a Ju it's a, there's a lot of clones of the Juki 341, which is the class I'm talking about. Cobra makes one, Cowboy makes one, but I I would recommend the Cobra one just because I love mine class three so much, but they make one that's the same 
model as our Texo 2750 Pro. And it's, you know, it's like a similar class to the Juki 1508, but it, it'll do some lightweight stuff. It's like a medium to heavyweight machine. It'll do some lightweight. You can do wallets on it. You can do canvas, um, but it'll also do a little bit heavier stuff. And you can get, you know, it's got a cylinder arm, so you can get around weird corners. And the cool thing is it also has a flatbed attachment, most of them do, where you can kind of turn it into a flatbed machine if you're doing mostly wallets or something. So um, I would recommend that. Just just know that you're not getting into like really heavy duty, you know, tack type stuff if you're getting that class of machine. Um, it doesn't like, I've noticed with my Texo, it really doesn't like using like a size 24 needle and 207 thread. It, it has a really hard time with it. Um, not to say that it can't, but I've just really struggled getting that heavy with it. So that's why I bought the Cobra. Whew, I've been talking a lot. My mouth starts drying up. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, I just got rid of that one. Keep smelling, keep smiling, fella. Greetings from India. Thank you, and I will. Any substitute of token oil? Good question. Uh, yeah, tokenol is just a burnishing agent. So there's a lot of different burnishing agents out there. One substitute is just water. I I use water a lot when I'm doing like knife sheaths and holsters and, you know, using like heavyweight tooling leather. Um, the, the thing that you would want to avoid with just water is that if you get too hot while you're burnishing, like let's say you're doing it on a, a grinding wheel like the MP burnisher, then water will heat up faster and you'll get like darker edges. So if you want to keep the edges looking natural, that's when you want to go with a burnishing agent like tokenol. You can use some liquid glycerin like saddle soap or gum tragacanth is another good substitute for tokenol. Um, anything that kind of, you know, adds some, it kind of lubricates a little bit so that when you're burnishing, you're not darkening the leather at all. And the other good thing is like tokenol, I, I don't want to say it's like a sealer, but it definitely like seals up the edge better than if you just use water or didn't use anything at all. Um, I would still prefer to follow an edge up with wax, I think, just because that really seals it up. But um, yeah, gum trag, liquid sa uh, glycerin, saddle soap. Um, what else did I say? I think that's, I think those are both good options as substitutes. All right. All right, I'm going to have to wrap this up pretty quick because I actually have somewhere I need to be, but I didn't want to not do this. I was really excited to do a live stream today. So thank you guys for jumping on. Uh, we'll do a couple more questions. Um, Gary Sweat. I know Gary. Hey, Parker, I'm headed to my first show this weekend. Because of you and a couple others inspire me, I'm just a few steps away from becoming a full-time maker. Man, I love to hear that. That's that's super cool. I can't wait for that day when you message me and say that you're officially a full-time maker. Although, nobody take that as me saying, go quit your job You know, until you're fully ready. I would hate it if someone quit their job to become a leather worker and it didn't work out and it was because of me or something. So, Play it safe, be conservative, you know, stay at your job as long as you can until you can legitimately pay your bills and take care of your in income completely with leather craft. But that's, that's why it's such a sweet moment. I mean, how much better would it be? How much like sweeter of a moment would that be if you had drug it out so long and you were at that point where like your face is turning blue and your eyes are about to pop out of your head because you're so tired from coming home from work and filling orders and you've just put in serious hours to finally be able to say, all right, I'm quitting my job because this is this is the moment. That That's going to be a good day. So um, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. This is a good question. Attila Eric Heipel. I'm sure I butchered that name. I'm really sorry, but beautiful family there. Um, how do you manage your life, family life, business growth, and making time? Dude, it's honestly, it's one of the heaviest topics I could get into and one of the most difficult things for sure. I'm going to hide this ticker because it's probably driving some people crazy at this point. Um, but 
it, it's tough, man. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I've got it all figured out. But I do want to say I'm extremely grateful for my life situation. The fact that I get to see my kids as much as I do. Uh, the fact that I work from home, um, that I have, you know, an open schedule and can do whatever I want whenever I want and get to work on things that I really love. I mean, I, it sounds cliche, but I genuinely get excited when I wake up in the morning to go to, to like get working on stuff. And I know that there are so many, I mean, the majority of the world I've been there for most of my life has that feeling like every Sunday night, you're like, man, I got to go back to work and I'm just dreading it. And you, you know, you just want to hang on to the weekend as much as you can. And it's sad, man. I, I know that feeling and I hate it. And, and I'm so grateful that I legitimately get excited to wake up and go to work. So I know it sounds really like cliche and, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk style, but I just, I love it. I love it so much. And so the thing that it gets, that gets really difficult is trying to decide when to be a dad and when to be a, a good businessman. Because I think if I could be putting in, you know, oh man, who who knows? If I was a single guy like on my own, I'd probably never go to sleep. It would be unhealthy, honestly, because I love the work so much and there's like nothing that gets me to want to stop. I just want to keep going. Um, the only thing that gets me to stop at this point is because I want to spend time with my kids and, and hang out with them and go eat dinner with them and, and take them to the park or whatever. So if, it, if I didn't have that, there's no saying, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I guess what I would say is that like, I try and just put in a decent amount of time to my work day. I used to do like 14, 15 hour days, especially when I was, all the production was on my plate. But at this point, um, I'm just trying to keep a healthy schedule of YouTube content and social media content up and kind of run a lot of the back end stuff. And uh, I try and fit that all into about an eight hour window, just a normal days of work. Sometimes it's more around 10. And then I usually work in bed as well. I do emails and stuff at night. So it's a little more than that. But if I can wrap up my day like around five or six and still go have like a solid day with my family. I don't know who's ringing my doorbell. But um, then I feel like I've I've got it pretty well balanced and figured out. <laughs> But I'll tell you, there's times though when like, you know, the, we have an extremely busy day where like, you know, Indy's got to be dropped off at school and Wit has to go here and we're going to go to the post office and there's like all kinds of things that have to happen at once. And sometimes I get put on dad duty where Wit's off doing something else and my anxiety starts rising very quick when I, when like it's the middle of a work day. And I wish I could just be enjoying like being with the kids, but my mind's just racing because I'm like, I'm not getting done what I need to and it's killing me inside. And so it's also works vice versa because there's times when I'm in here working and I look at the window and Wit's out there like riding bikes with the kids and they're having fun and they're having a little picnic or something. And I'm like, man, I just want to like hang out with them all day. I don't want to be in here. So, um, you know, and then that kills me. So there's, the poll is equal. Well, that's not true. I'm pulled a lot more to my family than I am the business, but it's a, a strong pull both ways and it's a hard balance. And I don't know that there's an honest, like good answer for that, but I just try to, you know, give as much time as I can to both and um, try to be present wherever I'm at. Like when I'm working, I try and just give as much as I can so that when I'm home, I can just be a dad without thinking about the business. That's one thing I envy is like so many people go to work and then they clock out and they don't even think about work until they get there the next day again. And that's just not the case for me. I mean, I'm constantly thinking about work and like, what kind of content should I be getting? Should I be filming this? Like there's, it, it's stressful. So I wish I could eliminate that a little bit. I wish I could clock my mind out as I walk out of the shop and just be like, all right, I'm done. I'm a dad now. I'm a husband. I'm just giving my life to my family. And you know, so it's, it's a tough balance, but again, I'm insanely wildly grateful for the life I live and just the, you know, being able to be with my family and work for myself. It's, it's incredible. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up right there. So thank you for the question. Um, thank you guys all for jumping in. This has been super fun. I love this new, uh, software streaming software I'm using. I can't wait to do more. So leave a comment um, and let me know what kind of guests you'd want to see. I'm going to um, start emailing some people and get some guests on here and 
Maybe we can learn from them. Maybe just have a good time. I wish we could do in-person guests. That's what would be awesome. Because sometimes these like live stream things are kind of weird because there's delays and you don't get like the honest feedback of a conversation. But um, yeah, I mean, thank you guys for jumping in. It's been fun. We'll try and do this like once a week or so. And that's it. Go contribute to the Venmo and, and win this bag right here. Shell Cordoban. Nothing else like it. All right, guys. You have a good weekend, and we'll catch you next week. Bye.